to the Word of God. We only had one child that would be in our children's program today, so we've invited them upstairs, so have a little patience with that, because they're not as quiet as you are. Alrighty? But we're going to stand in respect to the Word of God out of the book of Nehemiah. Ezra caused all the people to stand as the Word of God was read. And believe it or not, the people held their place. They must not have had a men's room or a ladies' room. They held their place and Ezra gave forth the Word of God distinctly because the Word of God is so important it is so valuable. So we're going to start off with 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 to 8. I want to read that to you this morning. It says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom, preach the Word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, for I am ready, already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. We're going to read two more verses together out of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2. And this is where we are going to camp out today as we give forth the message. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, uh, most believe written by the Apostle Paul or Barnabas. It says, Therefore we also... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily ensnare us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Father, we pray today that you would bless your word as I prayed earlier at our 10 o'clock adult time, Father. We know that your word does not return void. But it always accomplishes your good purpose and your good pleasure, and we pray for that today. We know that faith does come by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So, Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit, as he's promised, would drive the Word of God home to our hearts that we could be the men and women of God that we should be. Lord, if there's one here who does not know Christ as Savior, uh, we don't want to assume that everyone knows Christ as Savior. We pray that today would be the day of their salvation, and we pray that we would commit ourselves today to finishing well. We ask it all in Christ's name and for His sake. Amen. You can be seated, folks. Kind of an unusual thing um, I have been evaluating in the last couple of weeks, finishing well because some things have taken place uh, in my life. One was that I reached another birthday, and you might guess I am closer to the finish than I am to the start. Some of you are not quite sure if you are closer to the finish. Uh, or if you are closer to the start. Also, I realized that a new year was coming upon us, uh, 2017. And I started thinking, I do want to 
finish well. I am the type of individual who likes to be authentic. I like to be an authentic. I enjoy being authentic. I'm just kind of watching. You know, I'm, I'm very used to preaching in the nursing home. I also am a chaplain over at Taunton State Hospital. You ought to see what I go through when I teach over at uh, the mental hospital. But um, God is going to bless and, uh, and see us through. But I like authenticity. I like people who want to finish well. I like people who really believe in living right, and they're not only concerned about the start, but they're concerned about the middle, and they're concerned especially about how they finish. A lot of people have not started well, but they finish well. God transforms their lives. God turns them around. God gives mercy, and God gives grace. There are others who started wonderfully. Do you know that it's easy to start anything? But they haven't necessarily finished well. But like I said, I like authenticity. I had a birthday just recently, as you know, and what took place, um, I have changed. Years ago, you'll notice I have a birthday card here, and years ago, when someone would give me a birthday card, I would shake it because I'd be looking for money, or I would be looking for a check. And if nothing fell out, I have such uh, an informative face, I'm sure that they knew that I was somewhat distraught over that, but I had to mature as I grew older. So I stopped shaking the card, and I'd say, oh, isn't that nice? But I took on some newer habits, being an older guy, I started looking on the back because I love Hallmark cards. But Hallmark cards are extremely expensive. But I would note that it was not a Hallmark. And probably the one place that I did not want a card from was the dollar store. You know, and yet, you know, a lot of people would still give me dollar store cards. So don't get offended if you've given me a dollar store card. We all have our weaknesses and our own pet sins, and I will even accept dollar store cards if, if you write something nice in it. Anyway, I told my daughter she was going to get me a, a dumb sweatshirt again with sports stuff on it, you know, New England Patriots or a sweatshirt, pajamas. I said, I have enough of that dumb stuff. I said, can you just get me a, you know, a gift certificate to Longhorns? I just want to eat. You know, Get me something that I can really enjoy. She said, sure, Dad. And I said, and when you pick out the card, I said, would you do me a favor? You know, I, I really don't want a, you know, a dollar store card. And could you do me a favor if there are some real sweet lines of sentiment in the card, would you underline certain things? Because that would mean something to me. And she was like, sure, Dad, you know, I know you by now, no problem. Well, wouldn't you know it? They come to our house, and they give me a card, and it is the generic forest scene. All right? You might think that's wonderful, but this is a typical dollar store card. And you'll notice the typical deer standing on the front of the card. And I looked at that, and it says, for a father, a father, who means so much. And I said, thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Ben. That's so sweet. And then I opened it up, and it was kind of funny. My daughter underlined every single line in the card. And it says, words can express how much it's always meant to have you for a father. Or how much love comes with this wish for you. Okay. You know, it's a little bit generic, but she did underline everything. She might be mocking me, I'm not sure. <laughs> Actually, I am sure. Because she wrote something in the bottom of the card. It says... Happy birthday, four exclamation marks. Dad, we did not buy this from the dollar store. Or did we? Either way, we mean every word and carefully chose this card for you. Love, Ben.
and Jamie. I feel like they were mocking me. What do you think? Yeah. You think so? Yeah. Well, well, you know, I get the consensus of the vote. I like things that are authentic. And if you don't know me real well, 90% of what I say is usually a joke and I'm making fun. But um, that was a nice card. Today I have entitled the message, Finishing Well. And we're looking for authenticity because there are a lot of fakes, there are a lot of counterfeits out there. We find that Paul spoke of finishing in the various stages of life as he prepared to have his life taken from him as he prepared to actually have his head removed from him in that first century. He seemed like he was at peace, that he was ready to lay down his life and to offer it up to God because he had finished his course. And he had run a good race. He had been authentic. And we see the actual race and motivation in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, as it teaches us how to run, how to race, and who it is that's at the finish line, the Lord Jesus Christ. So he really reviewed the how, the why, and the importance of finishing well, and again, the motivation being Jesus Christ. And I'm sure you would agree again, anyone can start. You know, I was talking to a patient this week who was having difficulty that she has kids and husband on the outside, and she's actually quite normal, but she's been through a lot. And I remember saying to her, anybody can make a baby, but it takes somebody special to be a dad. It takes somebody special to be a mom. And many times we get transplanted into the lives of others to be their dad, to be their mom, and if that doesn't happen, the Lord God says, when your mother and father have forsaken you, I will take you up. We want authenticity. We want to be real. And you know what? Even the lost world knows when we're being fake. They know when we are counterfeiting something. Now, some of you here today, you're not sure if you're closer to the starting point or closer to the finish, others here, you have no doubt you're closer to the finish. Right? I know I am closer to the finish than I am to the starting point, but we understand the Lord could come at any moment and that would surprise us all in a wonderful way. Amen. That would be a great thing. The point is finishing well, even though we don't know exactly when the finish will be. In the 2008 Olympics, there was a U.S. Olympic hurdler. Her name was Lolo Jones, and she was rated number one in the world. And she ran in the hurdles, and when the gun sounded, she took off, and immediately she was in the lead, and she started leaping over those hurdles, and she was leaving the pack in the dust, so to speak. And if you had watched the beginning, if you had watched the middle, you would have thought very quickly, there is no way that Lolo is not going to win this race as anticipated. Well, then tragedy struck. The hurdle, right before the last hurdle, her toe caught the very top of the hurdle, and it threw off her timing, it threw off her stride, and she staggered just a little bit. And you're racing world-class athletes, so she very quickly went from first to seventh. And she finished in that position, and all you could see at the finish line was Lolo on her knees, banging her fist into the ground, crying out, Why? Why? Now, if you had taken a snapshot of the beginning of the race and the way they broke when the gun sounded, you would have said, wow, Lolo's going to win. If you had taken a picture or a video footage of the middle of the race, you would have seen her breaking ahead. And you would have assumed that she was going to win 
that race, but understand she did not win the race. She did not finish well. Listen, James 4.14 says, For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a short time and then vanishes away. Proverbs 27.1 was on my heart this week also, where it said, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for you know not what a day may bring forth. We need to be concerned with finishing well. We go about, we live our lives as though we have all the time in the world, and the person we talk to today might be the last person we ever talk to. So we want to make our life count. I know you have your plans. I know you have your vacation set. I know maybe you have your retirement home set. And you've decided everything you're going to do with your life. And you know what? God could mess that all up. And we better understand that. I told you recently, Karen and I have been talking, and I said, Honey, if you leave before I do or I leave before you do, and I'm older than her, so it could be me. I said, whoever's left behind, will we still love God? Will we still be bound, our hearts knit together with the Lord? Are we determined by our relationship how much we love God and what we give to the Lord? And we have decided, no, we're going to love God to the end and we are going to finish well. And by God's grace, because it takes God's grace, doesn't it? Because He knows we're dust. And He knows that we're finite, and yet we ask for His grace to be able to accomplish that. A few things I want you to notice about finishing well. Number one, and I hope that you got a bulletin. You, say, you might say, well, it's blank. Well, exactly. You know? <laughs> write the title in. Write the text in. Uh, some of the PowerPoint is on the screen, but I will give you other verses to mark down. I think it's always important to go home and to study over what you heard so that you can grow and you can expand what you heard. And uh, I don't think either that you should ever just accept every word I say as perfect and truth. You might see something and say, wow, I need to ask Pastor Gary about that. And that is entirely okay. The first thing, notice it's for those who have gone before. Verse 1 says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. A cloud of witnesses. Has that ever intrigued you? That has intrigued me. I always thought to myself that it was just those people in heaven who had already died, who were kind of cheering us on as we run our race. But I happen to believe it's more than that. I happen to believe the cloud of witnesses is comprised of saved folks and lost folks alike. I happen to believe it's folks to the right and folks to the left and people behind us and people in front of us and departed saints above as well as the angelic host are viewing what you and I are involved in doing. We're surrounded by witnesses who are looking at our life and watching to see if we finish well. Some of you here, when you receive Christ as Savior, you know what your lost family said? Oh, keep your eye on her. She's into trends. She's always doing something new. He's always into something new. It won't last. Just keep watching. It'll be something new next week. And that's how people view us. You know when people are really going to sit up and take notice is when you go through adversity. When you go through problems. When you go through heartaches. If you trust the Lord. And if you keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. For some strange reason, there's a new brand of Christianity that says when you receive Christ, no more flat tires. No more car breakdowns in the rain. No more financial adversity. No more arguments or displeasure or negative happenings in your life. I kind of thought when I received Christ as Savior, there was suddenly a target on my back. And suddenly things heated up and got even 
more difficult. Listen, you have a Savior. You have a Holy Spirit living within you to enable you and empower you and encourage you. And that's what makes the difference. Now, if we went back to chapter 11, you know Hebrews chapter 11 is the great faith hall of fame, the great chapter of those who have gone before who were faithful. Who are some of the people who are mentioned there? I just listed a few. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, to name a few. But you know who are the uncommon participants? Well, verse 35 says, women. Who were they? What were their names? God knows. But they're not listed out by their first name, by their proper name. But God acknowledges them. And God acknowledges you. And God acknowledges me. And then in verse 36 it says, others. Who were they? God knows. There were others trusting in the Lord and looking forward to the promises that God made to the Messiah. Then verse 37, same kind of thing. They. Who were they? God knows. God is aware of how you're running your race this morning. God is aware of your faithfulness. God is aware of the obstructions and the things that are attempting to slow you down. But His grace is sufficient. And His power is made perfect in weakness. Amen? So that's a real important thing for us to know. I mentioned departed saints. I think there's a cheering section up there. As the saints look on to what we're doing. How about if you've lost some people who knew the Lord? They're part of that cloud of witnesses and you will be united with them one day. And then the angelic host. And I remember a professor way back in Bible college, he can't possibly still be alive with the age that I am. 1 Peter 1 and verse 12, the last part of the verse, it's talking about redemption. Human beings having the opportunity to confess their sin and get right with God, the angels did not have that benefit. And it says in this portion of Scripture, 1 Peter 1.12, things which angels desire to look into. And I remember my professor, Dr. Clark, saying it's almost as though the angels are peeking out of the portals in heaven Seeing people turn from their sin and turn towards Christ, they're amazed by it. It's the most phenomenal thing. And they know it's a good thing. And that's why Luke 15 says they rejoice or they party in heaven when a lost sinner comes to the acknowledgement of who Jesus Christ is. Secondly, the procedure for finishing well. Well, I'll just sit here and do nothing and not equip myself and not be in the right places and not read my Bible and not pray and not need any kind of godly counsel and I somehow will finish well. Talk to a professional athlete in the Olympics and see if that would win them the gold. I dare to think not. The procedure for finishing well, we have to get rid of some things, and it seems like that's our responsibility. Well, that's not fair. This is a supernatural faith. I used to have a young girl, she was in her 20s, in my church, and I was trying to get her to serve the Lord, and she was from California, and I'm not picking on people from California. But she talked like the typical California girl. And she said, well, Pastor Gary, if God wants me to do something, he'll just have to reach down, pick me up, and send me on my way. I said, oh, really? She said, that's how it'll have to happen. You know, we have a lot of Christians like that. They don't talk that way. But they live that way. If God really wants me to do it, He's going to have to grab me and force me. 
and yell to me so that I know it's Him. Gosh, the Bible says a still small voice. The Bible says some of the promises, many of the promises in the Word of God are conditional. Draw nigh to me, and I will draw nigh to you. So there are procedures for finishing well. And we find in the last part of verse 1, Hebrews 12, lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily ensnare us. I can't imagine running a race, you know, with big baggy carpenter pants on and filling the pockets with sand and wearing hiking boots and expecting to run well in a marathon. You know, have you seen the swimmers in the Olympics? It's almost obscene. You know, I mean, these little teeny Speedo things that they wear, they shave their heads. The men even shave the hair off of their legs so that there is no resistance. And they can move through the water as fast as possible because just a split fraction of a sentence of a second, you'll win or you'll lose. God says, lay aside your weights. Weights are not necessarily sin, but they can be distractions. And I think we're guilty more of weights in our life than we are of sin, even though we all still sin and need to confess those things when they happen. What is it in your life that keeps you from growing in the things of God, in the things of Christ? It seems harmless in itself, but many times those things overtake us. You know what we do sometimes? We place the important over the urgent. Have you ever sat down to do something urgent? It has to be done right now, and then something important runs by, and you push the urgent aside, and you jump up, and you run after the important, and suddenly it hits you, wow, I had to do that. I had to get that done. I'm in trouble now. So we have to lay aside the weights, the distractions. Doesn't the Bible say, gird up the loins of your mind? Gather in the loose thoughts so that we can be focused. And then the sin. The lawlessness. Doing things which God has forbidden and not doing the things that He has commanded. How about wrong thinking? We've been over that a lot, even in our Wednesday night Bible studies. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5 tells us to bring into obedience every thought into the obedience of Christ. We say that can't be done. Yes, it can. If it becomes habitual. If it becomes a habit. Don't you know when you're thinking the wrong way? Don't you know when your thoughts are not what they ought to be? The older you get, the more you'll catch yourself. And you'll say to yourself, you know what, I had victory over this a year ago and here I am doing it again. I need to stop and I need to put off the sin in my life. The third thing, the wisdom to run with patience. Have you ever prayed for patience? We know that, that joke, don't we? We don't pray for patience anymore because God sends tribulation to help us be more patient. Right? So it's like, I'm not praying for patience. But really through the hard times and through enduring and having that long-suffering fruit of the Spirit, that is how we accomplish what God wants to accomplish. James 1.4 says, let... Did you hear that word? Very small but important. Let allow patience to have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, and get this, lacking nothing. Wouldn't that be great to lack nothing in our growth, in the Lord, in our journey? This morning at 10 o'clock, we looked up a couple of verses in, in Proverbs. We said, remove not the ancient landmarks that our fathers have set down. And then it went on to say, remove not the old landmarks, both coming from the Hebrew word olam, meaning from everlasting to everlasting, the things that God has set down, even in 2016, don't lay them aside. Honor them. Embrace them. Live them. 
Be willing to die for them. Because they are your life. They are your health. They are your vibrancy with your walk with Almighty God. Patience. Listen, are you further along in your journey or Christian race now than you were before? And I want to give you an eye-opener. In your mind, when I talk about the Christian race, you think of a normal marathon. You think to yourself, okay, I'm such and such years old. However long a marathon is, how much is it? 20 what? 26.2? It's been verified by Bill. It's good. 26.2 miles. Maybe you think in your mind, because of the age you are, you're about on the 23rd mile. Or the 24th mile. Or maybe you're on the 5th mile. You're a lot Younger, So we get the idea of distance when we talk about the Christian race. And I don't think that's what it means. One great author said, it's not a question of longevity, but likeness. Because we're all different. Some of you have five talents. Some of you have three. Some of you have one. And you know what God will judge you by? The likeness. 1 Corinthians 3, when you stand before God one day as a Christian at the judgment seat of Christ, He's not going to judge you by how much you did. He's going to judge you of what sort your works were. Why did you do what you did? What was your motivation? And if your motivation was to praise God and to glorify God, those things will abide. So if you're not being changed into the likeness of Christ, what's slowing you down? What's impeding your progress as you endure and maintain and grow? Listen, the promises of God are that everything will be taken care of. We won't fail in any area if we have that patience as we serve the Lord. Now here's the motivation. Number four, your race has been set before you by Jesus. Is Jesus fair? Does Jesus know I have short legs? Does Jesus know when I walk with somebody who's 6'3 or 6'4, I have to take two steps to their one to keep up with them? When I was a little kid, people used to say I was pretty fast, and they'd say, look at the little legs on that guy. He's like a blur. I'd be You have to move your legs faster if you're going to beat the guys with the long legs. Right? God knew that, so He just gave you more speed. You know, more repetitions. God just did that. Does God know who we are when He sets our race before us? Does He know your weaknesses? Does He know your circumstances? Does He know your life? Does He know your hindrances? Does He know your emotional makeup? Does he know where you get depressed and you get hurt and you get negative and you get moody? Does he know all that? Yeah, he does. He knows every bit about you and about me when he sets the race before you. So don't compare your race with anybody else. Your race has been set down by Jesus. He's at the finish line. And he is your motivation. Well, yeah, Jesus. uh, Who's that again? God. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the author and the finisher of our faith, the Creator. Colossians 1.17, by Him all things consist. You realize He's holding you together? Do you realize, if you're like me, that you're falling apart? I go to Planet Fitness, and I was teasing with folks at 10 o'clock this morning. The guys at Planet Fitness, even if they're skinny, they all walk like this. So I do that. Karen, if she's there with me, she doesn't even want to make like she knows me. She's like, don't, don't even come near my machine. You know, and I walk by, hey, honey. You know, and she just makes like she doesn't know me. You know? Why do you walk like that? Dayton, do your muscles get in the way when you walk? <laughs> you know? And he's got muscles. I have felt his arm. Scott's got muscles. I don't see you guys, you know, walking like that. And I know you have a comeback, and don't give it right now. (laughs) 
Listen, I want to be muscular in a spiritual way. Right? Bodily exercise profiteth little. Rather exercise thyself unto godliness. If we were to look at your physique, spiritually speaking, and put it up on the screen, what would you look like? Who would you look like? You know? Would you be muscular? Would you be like chiseled out of marble? You know? What do you think we can be? Doesn't matter what our age, doesn't matter what our ailments or our circumstances, there are champions of the faith walking around who have difficulties. And yet they put all their trust in God. Greater is He that's in me than He that's in the world, right? And that is an excellent, excellent thing. So understand Jesus has set down the race before you. That ought to encourage you. That ought to motivate you. That the one who stretched out his arms and was crucified said, here's what I want you to do. Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. Now, your race, call it your calling, call it your purpose, call it your destiny, your contribution to the kingdom. Jesus has given you an area He wants you to compete in. He wants you to finish. Nobody here is in the same circle of influence so that we can reach more people. Look to Jesus at the finish line. Now, if we shoot back into the Old Testament, Joshua, the first chapter, I love to call those verses conditions for success. As Israel was getting ready to go into the promised land and Moses, the servant of God, was dead and Joshua was given some instructions, one of the things that's always been my problem and the one that I like to read the most is the end of verse 7 when God says, turn not to the right or to the left. Focus. Keep your eye on the finish line. Keep your eye on Jesus because either your flesh or Satan or circumstances will keep throwing things in your way to distract you and take your eyes off of the Lord. What will the result be? You'll prosper wheresoever, wheresoever you go and you will finish well. Now I want to ask you a question. I talked about this at the hospital, I'm there about 20 hours a week, as well as being here with the church. And we talked about this in the hospital. What are you permitting to define you in your life as you move forward? If people tell you you're no good, do you believe you're no good? If people tell you you'll never make it, do you believe you'll never make it? Does that ruin your day? If people hurt you emotionally, can you put your head up and say, I do what I do for an audience of one? As I stood in the hospital getting ready to speak and that guy came in, who usually is politeful and says, Hi, Pastor Gary or Chaplain Gary, but he came in this time and said, You think you're Jesus? You think you wrote the Word of God? You're nothing! Then he left the room and I was talking about finishing well and I asked the folks. It worked perfectly. I think the Lord sent him in. I said, now, folks, does that define who I am? And they said, nope. I said, no, God defines who I am. Jesus, who loves us, He defines who we are, and that's the one who has set down the race before us and the one that we follow and the one that we trust. There was a female patient there, and boy, she just impressed me. She said, let me get this straight, Pastor Gary. She said, because we don't know when our end is. You say finish well, but we don't know when our end is. Shouldn't we then treat every moment as though it could be the end? And it could be the finish line? Shouldn't we be living acceptably to the Lord presently? Just in case this is it? I thought to myself, wish I had said that. And I looked at her, I forget her name now, it doesn't matter. I said, good answer. That's exactly what I'm shooting for. 
if this is my last day in this world, am I finishing well? The last person I get to talk to, did I encourage them? The last set of adverse circumstances that came my way, did I say, you know what, I'm more than a conqueror. I'm victorious. If God be for me, who can be against me? Give your life to God. Allow God to alter your perspective so that you can finish well. You're in a race, but it doesn't matter how close you are to the finish line. You're close to the finish line if you're constantly being transformed into the likeness of Christ. That's what finishing the race is all about. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. Heads bowed and eyes closed. As always, I am not going to attempt to be the Holy Spirit of God and decide what you might be thinking and what decision you might need to make. And in a small church, it's very easy for me to know some of your situations, some of your problems, some of your challenges. But I don't know you like God does. So right now, as you bow your heart before the Lord, you might be going through some things that only you and God know about. might be within your own fiber of your being, your emotions, maybe fear. Maybe Satan's attacking you over things that you already thought you had victory over and you're feeling it again. We all have some baggage. And maybe right now you'd say, Pastor Gare, I want to finish well. I don't know when that end is. But I want to be presently attempting to be transformed into the likeness of my Savior, Jesus. Please pray for me today. Is there anybody like that today? Lift up a hand. I won't embarrass you. I see your hand, brother. I won't embarrass you. I see your hand, dear lady. I just want to pray for you. God knows. God knows your heart. Anybody else? I have some stuff in my life. You know, maybe you're way down the road in your race. Maybe you're just starting out. I have some areas in my life I want to give to Him because I want to finish well. Maybe it's the sin of presumption. You think you've got all the time in the world. You've got all kinds of plans. And yet, Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Thank God He promises that what He has begun in us, He will finish in Philippians 1.6. Maybe today you're going through some hardship and you'd say, Pastor, pray for me today. Anybody like that, just keep me in prayer. I see your hand, dear lady. I see your hand, dear lady. I see your hand, brother. Just reflect on the Lord for a moment. God is mindful of who we are and what we're up against and He wants to give you the victory. Father, we thank You that we could be here today. And Father, we know that the strong right arm of the flesh will fail us. We know it's not by might nor by spirit, but by Your, your Spirit. Not by might nor by power, but by Your Spirit, saith the Lord. Father, we can't accomplish anything on our own. We're dependent on You. We need You for every step of the journey. Please fill us with your spirit. And Lord, whatever the challenge is, hands that were raised, hands that weren't raised, please give us victory. We love you and we thank you that we can come to you and rest on you and deposit our cares at the foot of the cross. Bless now, we pray. We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Linda.